In God we trust. It's printed on our money. It's in our Bill of Rights. We talk about God throughout the early days of our nation. And it's interesting to me that despite the efforts of many agnostic liberals to remove in God we trust from our currency, it's still there. The question for me on this anniversary of 9-11 is in God we trust written across our hearts. Does the phrase in God we trust still exist across our lives, across the American psyche? That's what we're going to talk about today. I'm Dan Sutherland, one of the pastors at Westside. Thrilled you are here, whether you're at Lenexa or over in the venue across the way, or maybe you're up at Speedway. We got two sets of guys joining us up at Lansing, as well as lots of folks on the internet. Hey, was it cool to have the men in blue join us in the park last week from Lansing? Was that awesome? <laughs> Love those guys. Thank you for being there with us. It was a phenomenal, phenomenal day. We're shaking things around a little bit today. The teaching is a little bit earlier in our time of worship today. And then we're going to come back and do some more worship, have a prayer, a memorial prayer for those who lost loved ones in 9-11. And I'm going to be back at the end and do a wrap-up on the teaching as well. But find your notes right now. The series we begin today is literally called How to be rich. It's a series we've borrowed. We don't do this but about once a year. But we borrow this series from two sources. There are two churches that we pay a lot of attention to here at Westside because they're further along the path than we are. One is North Point Church in Atlanta, Georgia, where Andy Stanley is the pastor. The other is Life Church in Oklahoma City, where Craig Rochelle pastors. Both those guys have done this series. So we've stolen their ideas, some of their content, some of our own. If you want to see the original stuff. You can go online at either one of their churches. They're both churches who give their resources away for free. I really love that. It's a pretty cool thing. But here is the, the idea that we want to start with today. Write this in your notes. You ready? This is not a series on how to get rich. If you want to study how to get rich, you need to check out late night infomercials. Or maybe late night televangelists. They seem to have some ideas on that. This is not a series on how to get rich. This is a series on how to be rich. Because the reality is we are richer than we know. And sometimes in our North American perspective, we've lost how blessed we really are. This is a series about how do we live rich, how do we be rich, how do we embrace what God has already done for us. Here's the big idea for the whole series. Write it down. Some of you may want to argue before we're done, but I believe it's an absolutely biblical idea. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. God has blessed me with more than I need. I am rich. Some of you are going, have you seen my checkbook? I get you. Do you realize a lot of us are out of work? Totally. And yet I believe that as American Christ followers, we are richer than perhaps we ever know. Let's have a little bit of fun today. What is rich? Have you ever noticed that rich tends to be a moving target? When I got out of grad school and got my first job and was making $18,000 a year, I thought if I could ever make 30, I'd be rich. Wow, what would it be like to make 30 grand a year? And then a few years later when I'm making 30, what did I want to make? Well, then I'm thinking, oh, 50 would be glorious. Wouldn't 50 be unbelievable? You know, studies show that most of us think rich is twice as much as we're currently making. That's generally the moving target, twice as much. If I could just have twice as much, I'd be okay. If I could just get to twice as much income, twice as much retirement plan, twice as much stuff, we, we kind of think that'd be, that'd be a nice, safe margin. Here's the question for you today. If you could be in the top 5% of wage earners, would you think you're rich? How many would think if you're in the top 5%, they'd probably be rich? Would that be cool? If we could get to the top 5%, that'd work. Here's the good news. We are. We clearly, clearly 
are. Let's have a little bit of fun. There's some stats in your notes there about what it means to be rich. Write this in. 50% of the world makes less than two bucks a day. That's actually a conservative estimate. Some studies show it's closer to 60. Less than two dollars a day. That's a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Or if you drink foo-foo coffee, it's half a cup. Because <laughs> they really charge you for the foo-foo. Have you ever noticed? Two bucks a day. 50% of the world, that's what we make. And yet for most of us, we just don't even think about two dollars being anything. You know, we throw that away several times a day, several times a week. You notice that nobody's diving for those? <laughs> now, if they were $100 bills, they would be. In fact, the pastors would be diving for them if they were $100 bills. $2 a day, another stat. Check this out. 4% of the world makes $37,000 a year or more. By the way, that's household income. If you have a household that makes more than thirty-seven grand a year, you're in the top four percent of the salaries of the world you see we in america have got this mindset that we compare ourselves to other americans no guys we are still the richest nation on the face of the earth even in this economic crisis we've got more stuff than anybody check this one out only three percent of the adults of the world own a car three percent I've been in countries where there's not a car owner for hundreds of miles. Now, there are cars that are owned by others that run them in for transportation, but there is literally 3% of the adult population of the world that owns a car. I know people here in America that have two. In fact, we're so into our cars, we build separate houses for them called garages. Half the world doesn't live in the garage space we have. For our cars. In fact, some of us are so rich that when our kid becomes a teenager, we get a third car. That's called, I, wanna, I don't want to drive you anywhere ever again. <laughs> Check out this stat. If you make $45,000 or a year more household income, you're in the top 1% worldwide. Now, we look at that and go, that's just not that much money. Top 1%. So here's the question. When God is writing out the truth of Scripture, do you think he was using a United States of America point of view? Do you think he was only speaking to us, or was he using a worldwide point of view? Obviously, he's speaking to the whole world. But if we, according to those stats, are in the richest four or five percent of the world, then the scriptures where Jesus speaks some really tough words to the rich ought to really get our attention. I'll be honest with you, it was not till a few years ago I ever considered the fact that I'm rich. But we're rich. Turn to your neighbor and say, you don't look it, but you're rich, baby. Tell them. <laughs> Be careful with the don't look it part. <laughs> Tell them they're rich. Good news. Write it in. We're rich. We're rich. We really are. But here's what that means. When the Bible gives instructions to the rich, God is talking to us. He's talking to us. And there are some tough words to the rich. Today, I want us to talk about how can we be rich in trust. How can we make sure that we're rich in trusting God? That's the idea. Here's the first passage, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 17. We're going to be in that chapter for the next three weeks. Command those who are rich in this present world. Now, that's us. Those who are rich, top 4 or 5%. In, who are rich in this present world, not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Any of you had money before that you no longer have? Can we see hands? Yeah, it's called I paid bills yesterday. It's called I used to have margin. It's called I used to work at a job where there was more money flowing. It's, there's no doubt that wealth is uncertain. 
In fact, the more you count on it, the more uncertain it can become. God is saying, don't be arrogant. Don't put your hope in wealth, but put your hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Here's the bad news. Good news is we're rich. Here's the bad news. Being rich can make it really hard to trust God. It can make it really hard to trust God. Here's reality. Most of us pray more when we don't know where the money's coming from. Most of us trust more when we're not sure how we're going to feed our family next week or how we're going to make the bill payment. Most of us talk to Jesus a whole lot more in difficult times than in flush times. And here's how it works. Look this way. The more you make, if you're not careful, the less you have to trust God. Now, is there anything wrong with making more? No, we'd all like to. But the more we make, the more we tend to not trust God. Look what's happening to the trust gap. I make a little more, I have to trust God a little less. I've got a little more margin, I don't have to pray like I used to. I've got a pretty decent retirement plan, yeah, God will be there, but I'm really counting on this. I think we as American Christ followers are living in this gap where our trust is more in our money than our hope is in God. Look at what Jesus said about it. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, why didn't he say you can't serve God and fame? Because fame won't capture you like money will. Why did he say that you can't serve God and success? Because success, while it's heady, will not capture you like money will. Why didn't he say to some of us, and I'm in this group, you cannot serve God and your good looks? (laughs) Because the reality is that's not the issue. Money becomes an idol like nothing else in our lives. And in the country who has more of it than anywhere else, We've got to watch for that idol. So we want to talk today about how to be rich in trust. Now listen close. This is not a teaching on money. It's a teaching on trust. It's a teaching on how do I make sure that as this goes up or down, my trust in God keeps doing this instead of living in that gap. That's the big idea for today's teaching. Here's the problem. Write it in. Big idea for today's teaching. Here's the challenge. I will not trust in riches, but in him who richly provides. Big idea for the series we've already done. That's the concept that I am rich. God has blessed me with more than I need. But today I want to talk about I will not trust in my riches, but in him who richly provides. How can money keep us from trusting God? I'm going to suggest three things right out of the scripture today. Listen for the one that might be your struggle. Listen for the one that might hit home with you. The problem with money is it can keep us from trusting God. How does it do that? Number one, write it down. Money can become the number one competitor for your heart. The number one competitor for your heart, for your emotions, for your affections, for your attention, for your focus. Here's the question. Do you think more about money than you think about God? It's a competitor for your heart. Do you spend more time and energy worrying about money than you do worrying about whether your faith in God is growing? It's a competitor for your heart. It quickly takes over our affections. And money is an awesome tool, but it's a horrible God. It's a horrible God. Look at what Scripture says, Ecclesiastes 5. By the way, this is just one verse. You want to read a whole chapter about money. Ecclesiastes 5 will have you laughing. I mean, some great wisdom in it, just punch you in the gut kind of stuff. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. A famous millionaire was asked one time, how much money is enough? And his response was, one million more. Now, I'm a little cheaper than that. Ten grand more. You know what? I'm feeling really cheap today. A thousand more. In fact, there's some days 100 more would be pretty cool. Some of y'all are going, shoot, 20 more. Sold! 
How much is enough? The problem is the more you crave, the more it takes to satisfy the craving. The more we make, the more trust can come down. It becomes this competitor in your heart. It becomes this thing that we just captures us and carries us. So we have a choice to make. Is our security going to be in Christ? Is our security going to be in our salary? Nothing wrong with a good salary. Is my security in trusting Jesus for my future or is my security in my retirement? Nothing wrong with a good retirement. Is my security in how much is in my bank account or how much is in this account? Jesus said, make treasure, translation, make money for yourself, not in this world but the next. We pay more attention to our earthly bank accounts than we ever think about the heavenly account. And when Scripture says some of us that are first are going to be last and last are going to be first, that's a scary verse when you apply it to the American standard of living. Because there are some godly, trusting people around this world living on two bucks a day that are going to be so much closer to the front of line in heaven than we are, we won't be able to see them from where we are. Is it because money's bad? No, it's because trust is good. I want to be rich in trust. Watch out, money will be a competitor for your heart. Number two, money, here's the trap, can never give you peace in your heart. It can't give you peace. Have you noticed that even when you make more money, cancer doesn't pay attention? Have you noticed that when you're wealthier, peace is not automatic? If you notice, they get the better house, the better job, the better car, the better wife. None of that fixes the condition here. One of my favorite mentors growing up when I first became a Christ follower was Bill Bright. Bill Bright was the founder of Campus Crusade for Christ, a phenomenal organization that's literally helped hundreds of thousands of people find their faith in Christ. And I heard Bill Bright speak one time, and he talked about this concept. He said, inside the soul of every human being, there's a Jesus-shaped void. And we all know the void is there, but we don't all know that Jesus is the only one that can fill it. So we spend our lifetimes trying to stuff things into that void. Anybody ever had this thought? Well, if I could just get a little bit better house, I'd be happy. You know, I, I need that extra bathroom. I, I just, we've we got to have that extra bathroom. And the kitchen's a little small, and, and, you know, if I could just get a little more space, you know, a little, maybe a walk-in closet, I'd be happy. Or if I could just get that promotion. Man, that promotion is the deal. If I, if I can just make that much more, wow, what, boy, that'd just be awesome, wouldn't it? If I could get the new car. Is there anything wrong with a better house, a promotion, or a new car? No! unless you're trying to stuff it into a Jesus-shaped void. Have you had the experience of buying a new car? Has this happened to anybody else? You drive it off the lot and realize you just lost three grand. <laughs> I mean, you've driven it a tenth of a mile and you've lost three grand. You know, I'm going, dude, don't, don't, don't dent this. I mean, I've noticed my stress can go up when my new stuff goes up. For example, first time we bought a new car, I parked way away in the parking lots. I didn't want anybody to scratch my car or dent my car. Have you seen my truck? I mean, the great thing about this truck is I'm going to park next to you and slam my door right into you. <laughs> don't park by me, baby. I don't care. The stress goes up when the stuff goes up. And it goes up even more when we're trying to stuff possessions and money into a Jesus-shaped void. It doesn't matter what you make. It won't buy you peace. And if the tendency is, as I get more, I trust less, what's happening to our peace? Peace is dwindling the more we make. It's a natural tendency. I make more, I trust less. How do we combat that? By not making more. No! By making sure we focus on trusting even more than we make. By making sure it is Jesus that we're trusting to fill that void. Look at what Scripture says. Better a little with the fear of the Lord than great wealth with turmoil. I've discovered in my life, the more I have, the more I worry about it. 
if I don't choose trust. I want to be rich in trust. It means I got to know that money's going to compete for my heart. I got to know it can rob me of my peace. But here's the third one, and this one is astonishing. It's a major new truth for a lot of us. You ready? Money can keep you from being generous. Some of you are going, Dan, didn't you say that backwards? It's like money can help you be generous. No, money can actually keep you from being generous. How does that work? When you're living with very little, you don't mind sharing the little bit you've got because you don't have a chance anyway unless God shows up. Are you with me? I mean, when you got $100 left to make it two weeks to payday, you're going, I might as well give some of this away. God's got to show up anyway. I had a grandmother growing up. My, my grandmother runs the kitchen in heaven. Now, your grandmother may be assisting. Mine's running it. And she lived a mile south of town in this little community of 400 people, Velma, Oklahoma. And uh, she was the first house on the highway going that direction out of town. So if anybody broke down or anybody needed anything, her reputation in the neighborhood and the whole community was, if you're hungry, Grandma Sutherland will feed you. If you need a place to stay, she'll put you up. And I can't tell you how many times we'd be sitting there at dinner with just enough food to feed us, and two people show up, and she'd say, kids, we're going to share a meal tonight. We've got somebody else who needs it even more than we do. Or how many times we'd be sitting at lunch ready to eat, and somebody'd call, and she'd hear about a need in the community. She'd say, come on, guys, we're going to pack up lunch and take it to somebody else. She had little, so she didn't mind sharing what she had. There had to be God in her week for her to make her week. But when we start having margin, our trust shifts to the margin, and our generosity shifts into low gear. You want to hear a scary statistic? There's absolute proof that the more we make in America, the less percentage we give away. You ready for this? The top 1% of income makers in America average less than 1% in what they give away. Oh, we get so impressed when some big corporation gives a million dollars to buy computers in KCK. Big whoop. Have you seen their profit statement? I'm not impressed. You're talking about a hundredth of a percent. Now, is it awesome that the money's available? Yeah, yeah. And by the way, if anybody wants help with that, we'll be glad to help you. In Jesus' name, we'll give it away. But the point is that the more we make, the more we hang on to it. Here's how it works. Well, we're saving for that new house, and you know, and I want to give, but I'm going to wait until we make a little more. Have you ever said that? When I make more, I'll give more. No, we won't. No, not unless trust goes up. I talked to someone not long ago who said, well, we want to give more, but we're working right now on putting a house at the lake, and once we get the house at the lake, we'll be able to give more. No, they won't. No. People give according to what's happening here, not according to what's happening here. It's not a wallet issue. It's a heart issue. And if my trust is going up, my generosity can go up and my ability to give it away. Look at what Scripture says. The wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. Now, that doesn't make quite as much sense to us as it had made to them thousands of years ago. So let me paint the picture. Back before we had aircraft, back before we had paid police, back before we had a lot of the things we have for protection today. The main protection for a town was the wall you could build around it. Because if you build a strong enough, high enough wall, you could keep your enemies out. That verse says that we, the wealthy, the rich, remember that's all of us, tend to try to just build our wall higher and higher and higher, and we're putting our trust in the wall instead of the keeper of the wall. We put our trust in our money instead of the source of our money. We put our trust in our income instead of the one who provides that job. We put our trust in our bank account instead of the one who has blessed us by letting us be in the top percentage of people in the world to begin with. 
We can't let money rob us of trusting God. In my life, the easiest times to be generous have been when I haven't had much margin. Mary and I have been married 35 years now. We spent three of our first four years in a used mobile home taking care of her 72-year-old mom who was dying, going to school, working extra jobs, no margin. And it was so easy to give it away. Yeah, it's just so easy. You need my last 10 bucks? That's cool. 10 ain't going to get me through anyway. I keep having to go back to that, Lord, you need my last piece? It's yours. Lord, you need my trust? It's yours. I want to be rich in trust. I want to encourage you right now to keep your notes available. But keep your heart open because here's what we're going to do. We're going to worship together in a few moments. Songs about trust. And what I'm going to encourage you to do today is to hold the truth of God's word in your hands and say, Lord, am I depending mostly on my money or mostly on you? Am I depending on my stuff or my source? And let him work in there to build trust. At the end of that time, I'm going to come back, do one final piece of teaching. And we're going to have a memorial prayer for the folks that are hurting particularly today. 9-11 is a tough day for anybody that lost someone 10 years ago. And my prayer today is that we'll become a people that will move toward in God we trust. Don't view this time of worship as filler. I am extremely capable of filling the entire hour. It's not an issue. We have planned this today so that we can take truth and reflect on it. So do business with God during this time of worship today. Then we'll be back to wrap it up. Let's pray together. Jesus, forgive me for the times that I put my trust in my stuff instead of my source, that I put my trust in my money instead of in my Savior. Lord, it's so easy to do. I pray in these next few moments we would all reflect, answering the question, where's my trust? God, make us rich in trust today. Speak to us, Lord. We're listening. We want to obey. We want to respond. In Christ, we make this prayer. Amen. Thank you so much. Would you be seated? Grab your notes. There's some of you going. He left out a blank. He left out a blank and won't be able to sleep tonight if you don't get the blank. Here it is. Our goal, church, is not to be rich in money. Our goal is to be rich in trust. I got to tell you, for a lot of years, I prayed, Lord, make me rich. I still pray it. Make me rich in trust. I want to hear my father say, well done, good and faithful servant. I want him to be able to point at us and say, have you considered my folks there at Westside? Look how they trust me. Look how they follow me. We are blessed beyond measure. God has given us more than we need. We're rich, but we can't trust in our riches, but in him who so richly provides. Speaking of trust, I had a great experience last night. How many of you saw the shack when you came in? Did you see it out there? I encourage you to go through it on your way out today or next week or sometime. There it is. It's about nine feet by seven feet, near as I can guess. It's got just enough room for uh, two beds down each side. Uh, well, here's the deal. Our pastors, at least one pastor and one other guy from the church, is staying in that shack for the next hundred nights. I stayed last night. Pretty phenomenal experience. And uh, the deal is we get here about 6 in the evening. We invite people to come hang out. About 20, 25 folks floated through last night. Great time together. And some of my buddies came late just to hang for a while. And this was a pretty wild moment. 
at 11 p.m. last night on 9 10 11 interesting date one of the guys looked at me and said will you baptize me in the pond and I thought it's 58 degrees what are you talking about <laughs> This guy's a new Christ follower, Josh Brooks. He's part of our security team here at the church. And I, I said, are you serious? He said, absolutely. My best friends are here. Let's get in the water. Is that cool? <laughs> Surrendering to Christ is the ultimate statement that says, I trust you more than me. I trust you more than my money, more than my stuff, more than my ability to control. I trust you. And my hope is that Josh getting baptized last night at the pond is the first of 100 baptisms that will occur over the next 100 nights. You want to come and hang any night, do it. Why are we doing the shack? It's a reminder that we're trying to raise a million dollars in 2012, next year, for folks that are living on that $2 or less a day, particularly for kids orphaned by HIV AIDS, for the work that we do on mission in Thailand, in South Africa, in India, and in Kansas City, Kansas. So come out and hang with us. Part of it is what will you give up for 100 days to be reminded on a daily basis that we are rich and we should be rich in trust. I want us to pray together a bit of a memorial prayer right now. I don't know if you've been watching the news the last couple of days. I caught a piece yesterday Ten-year-old girl who never knew her parents. Doesn't have any memory of them. They died in 9-11. Firefighters who laid down their lives knowing they were going into a building that was going to come down. America lost a piece of her innocence ten years ago. And I know if you remember, but for a short few weeks, there was more God talk in this country than there'd been in decades. There was more trust. And I'm wondering right now if the economic crisis we currently find ourselves in isn't round two of us learning as a nation and as the people of God particularly to trust Him. So I'm just going to give you a few moments of silence. You pray for the families, if you will, of those who lost loved ones, friends, parents. And then I'll pray to lead us together. Jesus, don't let us forget. Don't let us forget 3,000 folks who died and tens of thousands of others who still live with a void. Don't let us forget that life is fragile and we are vulnerable. Don't let us forget that our hope is in you. Forgive us, Lord, for trusting our ability, our wallets, our plans, when you're the source of it all. May we as a nation once again be rich in trust. May we live out in God we trust. Is our prayer in Christ. Amen. You can't do this thing called the Christian life alone. If you're trying to, we got hope for you. Life groups start this week. If you haven't signed up, place in the commons, also go online. Be rich in trust this week, church. God bless.